all. Thank you for coming. Appreciate you being here. Amen. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is lines, boundaries, yeah. Amen. if you will. But let me go ahead and do all the obligatory stuff. And I'm going to talk about some of this obligatory stuff. Giving honor to God, will the head of my life, etc., 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 etc. Amen. Some things just ought to be a given. Yeah. By how you walk. Yeah. By how you live. Uh -huh. So if the way you walk does not exemplify that God is the head of your life, oh. yeah. <laughs> you know, your words get to the point where they have absolutely no meaning. Come yeah. Amen. Right? Amen. I mean, that's Amen. keeping it 100. Amen. And then there are also those of us who have no lines, no boundaries. And I'm going to talk about lot. I'm going to talk about the law and grace and mercy. And when you leave here today, I want you to ask yourself, where are you? Amen. Who are you? Uh, but before I step there, I, I preached the last time a month ago about marriage. Yes. And because I live streamed my messages, I had some people that were upset with me. Come on. And I went back and listened to my message again, just to make sure. Come on. Because I know Sister Vicki will testify to this. I made Claim that we had the law yes. which left no ambiguities about what it was that would happen to you if you violated that law. Yes. I also made it clear that under the New Testament we have grace and mercy. Yes. Yes. So there is nothing that you could have done in this life that God is not capable of taking the law from around your neck and through grace and mercy forgiving you for whatever it was that you may have done. Now, does that mean that there might not be a price for you to pay? No, it doesn't mean that there might not be a price to pay. Because sometimes we have to pay for the things that we do in this life, in this life. Amen. But it is what happens in the afterlife that we must be mindful of. And why do I talk about those hard things that people don't want to hear? Because, you know, I can stand up here and give you feel-good messages all day long, and you know, with the way some churches and churches are today, I have women throwing their underwear up here in the pulpit, and some men too. They feel so good about the message that I'm preaching. Because many people go for that feel good message and not the truth about where they are, so that they can do personal examination and take stock. Because I keep telling you. You are either all in or all out. God ain't accepting fence, uh, fence sitters. Oh, right. There is no room for fence sitters. Come on. Every person shall be judged. That includes the, 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 the saved. Every, nowhere in the Bible does it say, I'm not going to judge all that have lived. And the books were open. The great and the dead. So at one, at some point, everybody is going to have a reckoning. So I will never apologize for speaking and reading what's in these pages. Come on. All right. So don't be mad with me. If I said something, and I'm speaking to those people out there in internet land, if I said something about marriage, understand this. I preach from my own point of view and my own failing. So you see, I got enough of my own mistakes. I ain't got to be talking about you. I can be talking about myself. And most times I am. Okay? My own kids. My own marriage. I speak from
from a position of knowledge from my own experiences and what I have learned about the word of God through trial and error. Yeah. Because sometimes we get hard-headed and we don't want to follow the examples of others. Yeah. Which is why we are now going to get into this where is your line? Because see, you might not have one. If you don't have one, I will be stepping on your toes today because everybody should have a line. There ought to be some things that you just don't do. Amen. Galatians 3 and 24, it reads, Wherefore, the law, now I'm talking about everything that was written as laid down by Moses, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all of that stuff. The law was our schoolmaster, and this is Paul talking, to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now that's a, there's a lot in that, in that one sentence. And, and basically what that's saying is, is, okay, so I gave you all these laws. And all these laws you got after I made this promise to this cat by the name of Abraham. About one day, all nations, all men shall have an opportunity to be blessed by being grafted in through Jesus Christ. Because, you know, this is when God made that promise to Abraham. But in the meantime, till we get there, all right. I got to let y'all mess up some things. So I got a guy that's going to come along. His name is Moses. And he's going to write out a whole bunch of rules and regulations for you to follow. And with those rules and regulations, there are going to be blessings and cursings and damnations and stonings to death and all manner of stuff that people just ain't going to like. But they won't have no choice in the matter because when they had an opportunity to just be righteous, the first man sinned. Him and his wife, y'all may know something about them. Adam yeah, and Eve. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Bringing sin into the world. So that that experiment failed. Where I just here you go. You got the garden. You got do anything you want, but this one tree. Stay away from it. They only had one thing to follow. Only one commandment. To follow. Right. And they messed it up. Yes. They messed it up. Then they're kicked out of the garden. And they became so corrupt. We got the flood. Well. So now we have these laws that come along. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be that schoolmaster for this reason alone. To show you that even if I write it down for you by the numbers, well, you still are going to fail. Well, See, so, okay, so hold up, hold up, hold up. And this is the beauty of God. So he's telling Abraham, one day I'm going to make a way for everybody to have salvation, right? When he's making this promise, he's talking about your seed will, 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 will be more than the sands on the beach, the stars in heaven. He's making this promise to him knowing, knowing, okay, that he's going to be doing some stuff in, in, in between all of that to show us so that when we do stand to be judged, yeah. you won't have no excuses. And that's what I be trying to save people from. See, I'm trying to help you unload your excuses ahead of time while you're still living and walking on the, the bright side of the sun because you see, the only people that can't change their minds are dead people. All right. Okay? Because see, once you live here, leave here, you can't change no mind. Well, so let's 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 talk about some of this stuff in between. Before we even get to those laws that Moses wrote down, we're gonna jump off and we're gonna talk about Abraham's nephew. His name was Lot. All right. Yes, Lot. Now, the Bible gives us many examples about many things. And God has done many things. But we don't always get an answer as to why we are told that we must simply trust God's word as being infallible. Right? Right. 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 
Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So if God's word is infallible, that means it, there's no need to improve it, right? It's infallible already, right? Yeah. And, and if it was right 2,000 years ago, it ought to be right today, right? Yes, it is. So if one thing was a sin back then, it, it's still a sin today, right? Yeah. But many of us, we keep forgetting that because we want to alter God's word and we want to ignore the parts of the Bible that, that don't quite make us feel warm and fuzzy. That's why we like, you know, good those good feel good messages because we want to be made to feel good and not be told the truth. Oh, you want to be made to feel good. You remember this guy named Jesus who was in the garden? I preached this sermon. Boy, this really upset some folks. I said, Jesus didn't want to die for your behind. Oh, they don't believe it. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Did you miss the part about the garden? Well, he went and then asked one time. He asked three times. Let this cup pass me by. He didn't want to get on that cross. No. If the Lord has said, if God has said, you don't have, okay, Jesus, I, I've heard your cries. Man, you sweating. You, the, the, the sweat coming off your forehead is as, is as drops of blood. You ain't got to go get on that cross. Don't you think Jesus would have taken that way out? Why would he have taken that way out? Because he was human just like us. Yeah. But he understood the higher calling. <clears throat> In other words, there would be no way for us had he not got on that cross, which is why at the end he said, not my will, your will. So I tell people all the time, seek first to understand, then to be understood, because if you're seeking to understand where I'm coming from, it's easier for you to be understood when you take it past where you found it. But we don't want to hear these hard truths because it erases lines. It erases our boundaries. So here we go with Lot. If you want to read the story of Lot, because I'm not going to read the whole story to you, you can go to Genesis chapter 19, verse 30 through 38 for the second one, which I'm going to cover last. And you can go read the first part of the uh, uh, story about Lot in chapter 19, verses 1 through 11. So the first one is this. Lot... There's a phrase that they say, he sat in the gate. What it meant literally for a person to sit in the gate is to be a judge for all of those within the city. Well. Lot was a judge for Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. Now, what do we know about Sodom and Gomorrah? It was a place where people engaged in certain sinful and carnal acts. Primarily that of homosexual activity. You with me? Now Lot fancied himself a moral man, a moral and just man. And even God, as we you read later on, said that Lot was a just man. Well, who else do we know that did some damnable deeds that God considered just? Well, if there's David, he wanted a man's wife, so he sent the husband up to the front line. Y'all, you remember that story, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. So I, I can give you, I can give you a uh, uh, person upon person that was righteous, but they still did some damnable things, and some of them paid a price for it. Well, okay. So here we have Lot, who is a judge over Sodom and Gomorrah, and one day, two angels, two angels, came to visit Lot, disguised as men. And the men in the city wanted those men yes. so that they may have homosexual relations with him. Now Lot knew that, well, you know, this ain't right. He knew it was wrong. Yet Lot still sat in judgment of this wicked place. He still sat in judgment of this wicked place knowing they engaged in certain acts that were against God. And on top of that, in the context of that time, a person would make great sacrifice to protect visitors to, that came to their home. That's just the way they did things. You protect people when they come to your home. 
You look out for them. You don't let anything bad happen to them. Right. Well, Lot knew that these people had no, no great thing that they wanted to do with these men. They wanted these men so that they could make them or use them as they would a woman. Yes. So what does Lot do? Lot does the unthinkable. Now, we don't know why Lot did it. There is no explanation for it. But later on, we'll find out why. I'm, I'm going I'm to give you some things that God did later on to address that issue. Lot offered the men in his town his two daughters. Yes. His two virgin daughters. Now put yourselves, men and women, put yourselves in the mindset of Lot. Oh, put yourself in this situation because I don't imagine you could put yourself in this mindset. Put yourself in Lot's place and a bunch of men come and George is your guest and they want to have George. Would you offer up your daughters instead? I would like to have thought everybody would have yelled out, not no, but hell no. I would not offer up my daughters. We find that unthinkable that a man would give up his two virgin daughters to be gang raped as opposed to the two strangers. Well, If at anything, Lot should have said, you know what? You got to bring some to get some. I'm going to you got to go through me to get to my guests and my daughters because I am not going to voluntarily let you do this. All right. yeah. That is what we think should have happened. But that's not what Lot did. Lot was willing to give up his daughters yes. for the crowd. Thankfully, the angels stepped up. So we see here, Lot had a line that he just simply erased. He got him a, he just got that, okay, yeah, all right, so I'll get rid of that now. Uh, you can have my daughters. He had no boundary. He had no boundary. He erased that line. And when I first read that, I thought to myself at the end of the story, how, how could God consider Lot to be a righteous man? Thankfully, the angels stepped up yeah. and took care of business, yeah. All right. saving both themselves and Lot's daughters. Yes. Later on, we find out that Lot has gotten older in years, and his daughters, they conspire. They say to themselves, there will be no men in this town for us to marry and carry on our father's name, the family. So what do they do? They erase a line. They get rid of a boundary. Yeah. And one night, one gets her father drunk, lays down with him, has sex, and conceives a child. The next night, she tells her sister what she had done, and the sister goes and do the same thing. So they both conceive two children, two, two families that gave the Israelites hell down through the years. Well, okay, you read about those two families. I'll let you look up those sons' names because I, I want you to go and read that story for yourself so that you can feel what I felt when I read that story for the first time, I was horrified. There are some horrible things that have happened in the Old Testament. Yes. Yeah. But there's a reason why we know about it. Because God, for a reason, wanted us to understand all of the people, even those that he considered righteous, he wanted us to know their faults, their failings, their sin, and their shortcomings, whatever they may be. Why? So that we could learn from them. So in the first part of the Bible, especially Genesis, we learn all about the human failties 
frailties, the human faults, the human sins of God's people when they had no rules because there, there were no rules laid. Once they were kicked out of the garden, they were pretty much on their own right. till God reached out and spoke to Abraham and gave Abraham some limited instruction. They didn't really get any instruction to live by until Moses. So man left unchecked is totally and utterly, most of us, we are totally and utterly depraved. That's right. When a child is born, it is the most selfish being that you can imagine. They will cry. They will do their business on themselves and cry until you come and clean them up. They don't care what time of morning, night, that they awaken you when they have an issue. They will cry and they will let you know. They have no concern for anyone else. And you take that baby and grow it into a, a man or a woman with no guidance whatsoever. We are capable of doing some horrible acts and deeds. Speaking for myself, it is better for you that I serve God. Why? Because I have some boundaries. There are some things that I will not do. There are some lines that I will not cross. And it is not because I am afraid of going to prison. It is not because I am afraid of being found out. It is simply because I know that this is what this is something that God would not have me to do. That's right. It's as simple as that. Well, why won't you? Why don't you want to go do it, Derek? It'll be fun because it ain't right. It simply just isn't right. So we have a man that's willing to allow his daughters to be gang raped. We have two daughters who go ahead and commit incest and get pregnant. And we have a man who allows his daughters to get him drunk in the first place so that he loses all sense of control and does not himself tell his daughters no. Because in Lot's right mind, he more than likely would not have allowed his daughters to have sex with him in the first place. Well, well. What prompted me to preach this message is an encounter that I had with a good friend who had no boundaries. And that bothered me. And I thought to myself, if we have no boundaries, what is there to stop us All right. if, we, if there is no immediate punishment to be had? Well. And some folk, when they realize that their boundary has been found out, they will try to make you suffer with them because they have been found out. So the lesson for all of us is to ask ourselves, is this a line that I'm willing to cross? Is this a boundary that I am willing to erase simply because I want to do it? And that is what we see with David. That is what we saw with Saul. That is what we saw with all these guys in the Bible, even when they had the law of Moses. And what do we find in the law of Moses? A son shall not lie with his mother. A father shall not lie with his daughters. Man shall not lie with mankind as he does womankind. Man shall not lie with the beast of the field. We see all these laws come into play in the book, uh, in, in the book of the Old Testament after Lot. After Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. Okay? 
after all of the wickedness that God saw in the land and decided to and, and repented that he had made man. God gave us the law after he made the promise to, to Abraham because he said, see, I still got to show them that even if I write it down for them by the numbers, they're still going to ignore my word. But I, I'm going to give them a back door. That back door is grace and mercy. Yeah. Yeah. And that back door exists for the smart Christians. Only the smart Christians. Yeah. Now, those of you out there in internet, man, understand, if you're not a Christian, I'm not talking to you. We'll all be judged. And this message might not be for you. It might not be for some Christians. But this much I promise you, when this is all said and done, from my perspective, I have nothing to lose by doing the right thing. Even if I were to say that there is no God, I still have, when I say, if I were to say there is no God, not that I believe that, but if there happens to be no God, if I were to believe that, even if I were to concede that there might not be no God, I've still lost nothing by being a good person. And if I'm right, it is better for me that I had believed than not to have believed, and it turns out that I am standing before the throne of God. So, in our minds, we already know whether or not we are individuals with no li lines and no boundaries. And when we get mad with the people that are in the pulpit, that talk about various things, when we get upset, you are an individual that needs to accept the fact that you have some lines and some boundaries that you don't like being called out. See, I'm telling you that there's a line there, that there's a boundary. Now, you may not want to acknowledge it for yourself, but God gave you that line and that boundary. First, he gave it to you with one rule when Adam and Eve were in the garden. Next, he gave it to you with a series of laws that carry with it reward and punishment. Now, he has given you another rule or two. Love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. Love your neighbor as you would yourself. On these two commandments hangs all the law and the prophets. What that means is if we have love in our hearts towards one another, I'm, I'm not going to molest your, your child and, and, and blame it on a, a sickness that I seemingly, seemingly can acknowledge but won't do anything to try and change it. I won't try and speak with your wife, my brother. Uh, mother Carzell, I'm, I'm not going to steal money out of your purse when you get up and walk to the back simply because, uh, you know, I know I need to put gas in my car and I'm going to get me me one way or another. So I won't do all in, any and all manner of nonsense that you see people engaged in because I have boundaries. Well, I have lines. There are some things that I'm simply not going to do because it's wrong. I have enough time wrestling with the stuff I do wrong that I haven't been able to get back over the line on already. Why do I need to add something else to it? I'm not trying to do that. Because as long as we live, we will sin. But we have grace and mercy. So, you out there in the internet land, I don't want nobody saying, oh man, he said that, you know, if you got lines and boundaries and you having a hard time with it, you know, you bound to hell. That is not what I said. And I'll, I'll, I'll say it again. No matter what our issues are, if somebody tells you about it being wrong per what's written in the Bible, you have an opportunity not condemnation. You have an opportunity to get right. 
the song we sing in here all the time, get right church and let's go home. Get right church and be ready to go home when that day comes. This was not a long message that I had to preach. But I felt that it I couldn't preach another message unless I talked about self-examination and our boundaries as Christians. Yeah. Because if you are walking around as a Christian and all you think God is is a slot machine to make you feel good when you go to church or finding a prosperity message that's all about you and your personal finances, yet you do absolutely zero to change the character of your content to be Christ-like, you have a problem. Amen. And I, as a Christian, and I, as your friend, and I, because I care, I cannot walk by you and not tell you that you have a responsibility and an obligation to live better lives, well, to be better Christians, Amen. and to understand that Christ didn't give us our salvation promising us that there would be no suffering, no sorrow, no pain. He did not. He gave us our salvation that we might have eternal life. Anything else that's good that we derive from being here in this life will be because of two reasons and two reasons only. People who do good things, good things tend to return to them. You reap what you sow. That's what that means. Okay? You reap what you sow. And God blesses those who love and serve him. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Thank you. Amen. 